the stereotype of a, of an entrepreneur is a 20 something year old whiz kid who figures out something in his university dorm it's not often you know the mid 30s married with a family on the way with a house and a mortgage i certainly wasn't a born entrepreneur i had to learn this but we knew that if we got this right we could change the industry in our particular corner of the world My name is Larang Sololwane. I'm an electromechanical engineer and I come from a, a small, wonderful country called Botswana. I run a company called Lucian Engineering and Construction. We essentially do the maintenance and physical asset management that companies either don't want to do or find too expensive to do in-house. Just to give an example of the size, a drag line weighs about 15,000 tons and would cost about a billion dollars. And it would take a crew of about 300 people two months to fix it. In my part of the world, the companies that provide the most scholarships are mining and engineering companies. So I was literally told, you want to go to university? You've got to go study this engineering thing. I never fell in love with the engineering technical aspect of it, but I fell in love with what engineering opened up for me. The ability to actually build things and solve problems. I worked for a company called De Beers, which is the largest diamond mining company in the world. Before De Beers came along, people weren't using diamonds for engagement rings. Diamond is forever is considered one of the greatest marketing slogans ever. The entire diamond industry was created by De Beers. It was a really interesting company to work for. Um, it gave me some fantastic opportunities. You can imagine a young boy from Botswana, you get to London, it's fabulous. I went to most of the world's great cities, you know, New York, Miami, Toronto, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Beijing, Dubai, you name it, we got to go there. At first, you're impressed. And then you start looking and saying, well, these places are great, these experiences I'm having are great, but what about my people? Who's gonna build a London for my people? And after a while, it goes from being a great experience to not being so great because you realize that this isn't yours. Your people, people who look like you, don't get to have this. When you don't have access to clean, reliable water, when you don't have access to transportation that can get goods to market, when you don't have power that allows you to even dream about building a tech or an IT company, everything else just doesn't happen. And one of the things that has prevented my part of the world from taking off is that we, we still haven't got the basics right. You're not going to build a YouTube or Google if people don't have enough food to eat. You're not going to build a General Electric if there are no roads. So it's not just utilities, it is the foundation upon which everything else needs to be built. So that was the real kick in the butt that made me want to find out what else I could do. In many ways, we brought a level of professionalism to our industry in our part of the world. Our industry offered people short-term contracts. People would work day-to-day, month-to-month, and we were amongst the first to offer long-term contracted employment. We provide pathways out of poverty and pathways into the middle class for the majority of not just our employees, but the smaller businesses, SMEs in our supply chain, who are then able to offer the same to their people. Our industry is highly skill intensive and not just the academic skills that you acquire when you're training, but the practical skills that you get from experience. And we are a bit of a talent factory. We give an excellent education to everyone who works for us or works with us. It has been an interesting journey. I was taken for trainings by the company and it took all the hard work to get to where I am. And to be honest, I wouldn't have probably made it if I was working elsewhere. So it was a bit of an evolution. There would have been a time when companies like De Beers would have done stereotypical things, like given away blankets. But over the years, the contribution has gotten more sophisticated and to me more impactful, culminating in De Beers' sponsoring of, of the SEED program helping foster and develop up-and-coming businesses that have the opportunity to transform the region. We're incredibly grateful to De Beers for doing that. And in fact, De Beers are doing what one day we hope to be able to do. 
Seed came along at exactly the right time when we had gotten through the initial how do you start this thing and how does it work to how do you make it great. Before Seed, at best we thought we might be a Southern African regional player. When we started Seed, we had about 150 employees. We had revenues of just under $4 million and we were located in one location. Since then, we've expanded to three locations in two different countries. We employed just under 500 people and our sales revenue for this year is going to be in the region of around $9 million. It has completely recalibrated our expectations for ourselves and our company. Botswana is a small economy. It's two million people. And there's nothing we can immediately do about that. So in order for us to grow economically, we have to change our mindset. And I truly believe that all aspiring entrepreneurs in Botswana need to look to the rest of the continent for opportunities to grow their business. And that's what's so amazing with Seed, is that Seed forces you to look outside. Seed forces you to see the bigger picture. I get nervous about this because the vision sounds really, really crazy. We're an engineering company and currently we construct and maintain equipment. My vision is simple. I want to bring water, power, roads, rail to my people. And that's why I wake up every morning.